Recognizing member for Vancouver Mount Pleasant. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise to speak to Bill 6, the Liquefied Natural Gas Income Tax Act. Now, Mr. Speaker, I can't help but to comment on some of the uh, remarks that the government members have made around this bill in relation to what the opposition's point of views are. Let me just actually put on the record very clearly for everyone so that there is no confusion whatsoever in terms of the opposition's point of view on the natural gas industry. The opposition has always taken this perspective, and that is to say that liquefied natural gas industry is far too important for us to get wrong in terms of how we proceed, how to move forward, and what the promises are from the government. We've always said that there are four essential principles that we want incorporated into the development of this industry, and that is to ensure that there would be guarantees of jobs and training opportunities for British Columbians. That's what we've always said, as opposed to the government's first order of business, which is to turn to an alternative source for uh, jobs and training. And primarily, they have been very much focused on foreign temporary workers. The opposition have always said that we wanted a fair, fair return for our resources. Much like for all of our natural resources, we don't actually stem away from that basic core principle. That is to say, these resources belong to all of us. Every single British Columbian has ownership of that resource. And we want a fair return of that resource back to British Columbians. The opposition has had a long history and continues to take leadership on this issue, and that is to respect the First Nations community, respecting them and recognizing them. And so, in this instance, is not any different. And what we've always said, and that is to say that the LNG industry needs to include benefits for the Aboriginal community, for the first peoples of this land. <clears throat> Last but not least, Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've always said as well that doing all of this work is always a balance. And as a core principle, we need to protect our land, our air, and our water, including living up to climate commitments. Those were the four principles that we put on the record about the LNG industry, contrary to what the opposition or the government members want to portray it to be the reality. Those are the four core principles. Now, I just want to set that aside for a minute as we debate Bill 6 to talk about what we know and what the government said and what this bill actually shows and how that matches up with what the government and more particularly what the Premier has said around their commitments around the LNG industry. We will all remember, Mr. Speaker, the grandiose promises that the Premier had made during the election campaign. We will all remember the hundreds, hundred thousands of jobs, the hundred thousand jobs that was going to land. You know, the death-free BC bus. You'll never forget the image of that death-free BC bus and how the LNG was going to wipe out the debt that it was going to um, uh, create the prosperity fund. What was it? A yeah. hundred billion dollars, uh, Mr. Speaker, that was going to be created for the Paris prosperity right. fund. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and then of course, we just finished debating Bill 2, the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act, where the government touts the LNG industry was going to be the cleanest in the world when we actually just finished de de debating Bill 2, and it shows very clearly is anything but going to be the cleanest LNG in the world, because the government decided in their way, right, to actually not include upstream emissions. Uh, in, the, in, terms of, uh, in terms of accounting, uh, accounting for that uh, for environmental purposes. Now, in Bill 6, what have we got? We have the development of the LNG industry uh, as the 
Minister of Technology, I think he said earlier, right? He said that we have no faith in, quote, the people. That's what he said, according to the, the uh, Minister of Technology. But let me be clear. It is not that we have no faith in the people, uh, Mr. Speaker. What we don't have faith in, it, have faith in is in the government. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's what we don't have faith in, and particularly we don't have faith in this Premier and her grandiose promises uh, and this government's uh, false commitments that they've made with respect to the LNG industry. So why do I say that? Mr. Speaker, you're wondering, well, why, why is she saying that? Well, let's just go back and review for a minute the Premier's record on the issue. As recent as back in February, the government was touting an LNG tax rate of 7%. That was actually part of the government's budget, uh, Mr. Speaker. 7% was what they said. And what have we got here? Bill 6, Bill 6 does not talk about 7%, Mr. Speaker. It actually talks about 3.5% at best. Mr. Speaker, the tax rate, the LNG tax rate has been reduced by half. That's really what we're talking about. The government says one thing and they turn right around and does another. Really, true to the Premier's pattern of behaviour, exactly what she does with pretty well everything. So the government says that they had to do this though because they always have a justification for things like this. They said they had to do this because of changing market conditions. Well, interestingly, Mr. Speaker, the market, market conditions actually didn't change all that much. That's the truth and the reality of it. You know, not the opposition who's been saying this. There have always been strong warnings from experts from experts who say that high prices in Asia wouldn't always last. Mr. Speaker, experts were warning that Japan's nuclear industry wouldn't, wouldn't always be shut down and that the Asian buyers would seek to negotiate lower prices through long-term contracts, Mr. Speaker. They have always said that BC would have to compete with new supply from the US, from Australia, from Russia, from the Middle East, and so on. And experts have always predicted that labor costs would rise if BC sought to develop multiple projects simultaneously. Mr. Speaker, and now all of those warnings, the government already knew. It was on the government's radar. Mr. Speaker, it wasn't like as if those things just pop up out of nowhere. I think what happened is that the government chose to ignore those warnings, Mr. Speaker. And very interesting, actually, if you go back to look at all of this information, back in September 2012, the Macquarie Bank wrote a report in which they doubted that even four LNG plants would be built in BC. And that they were predicting that BC would become an LNG exporter not until 2020. So that's actually a prediction from the banks. But that didn't stop the Premier making her stop the Premier in making her grandiose promises during the election campaign, Mr. Speaker. And that they also say. The report also says that the, delay, the delays, the cost overruns in the emerging markets are all real threats that could undermine the economics of the projects. This was actually on the public record, Mr. Speaker, back in September of 2012. September of the 2012. And the government had access to this information. The Premier had access to this information. The Minister of Gas had access to this information. Mr. Speaker, so it's not news to them. Then, of course, in February of 2013, the government came out with the predictions for the prosperity fund, which, as mentioned, we've all heard this, 100,000 jobs, right? 
100,000 jobs in the prosperity fund that was going to supposed to have what was it 100 billion dollars in the fund to retire the debt and now with this bill i'm not quite sure actually when that's going to become reality i'm not even sure if the bill actually even talks about the prosperity fund mr speaker so what's happened to that grandiose promise and it's not like the government didn't know it they knew it they knew it i guess this this premier's pattern right go and say whatever you want about pretty well anything and then not worry about whether or not you could actually deliver on those promises i think that's the pattern of behavior from this premier then mr speaker in april of 2013 at an LNG conference, LNG conference in Vancouver, global energy experts doubted the, credibil the credibility of the Premier's optimism, and they said Asian buyers won't be paying the windfall prices that have been in place since Japan shut down 48 of its 50 nuclear power stations after the Fukushima uh, disaster, and that Asian buyers would seek to decouple the prices of gas from the price of oil and that BC will face stiff competition over prices with new supply coming from Africa, the US and Australia. So the government knew this information, had this information, Mr. Speaker, but still they persisted with their empty promises to British Columbians. And now then, of course, going forward till May 2013, City Group warned that we would face increased supply competition after the U.S. Department of Energy approved 26 LNG export facility applications in Texas on the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Mr. Speaker, this information ought to be, I would argue, be on the government's radar before they made the promises. Like, is it really possible that the Premier would actually go and make all these grandiose promises without actually doing her homework? Is that really possible for someone who's running the province of British Columbia would actually go about doing that work without making these promises, without actually doing the homework? Like I sometimes think that is just not at all possible. But here we are. Here we are. We have proof yet again that's exactly how the Premier conducts herself and how she does her business. The expert information does not stop there, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, in October 2013, Canada West Foundation wrote a report titled Managing Expectations, Accessing BC's LNG Industry. And he said that Asia may soon have more than enough natural gas of its own, and BC will face competition from domestic production in China and from the pipeline imports to China. The Minister of Gas responded to the report by saying, quote, I don't mind being accused of being optimistic, end quote. Well, here we are. The net res result of that is that Bill 6, instead of having the 7% tax regime that the government claimed that they were going to have, we now have a reduced tax return at 3.5% to British Columbians. But that doesn't stop there. Even at 3.5%, at uh, Mr. Speaker, there are major loopholes in this bill major loopholes that would actually see that 3.5% diminish. In fact, one of, such, one of those loopholes would be the corporate income tax credit, which could reduce the corporate income tax paid by companies by up to 3%, offsetting the 3.5% LNG income tax. So that reduces it by another 3% with the um, corporate income tax credit. But that doesn't stop there either, Mr. Speaker, because there's another major loophole. And that other major loophole is the investment allowance, which means that the LNG companies get to earn a guaranteed profit that is exempt from the LNG tax. So that is a guaranteed profit before the LNG tax is even applied. So 
even at 3.5%, that was, that was reduced from 7%, you still, affer, you still see a further reduction of that, Mr. Speaker, according to Bill 6, through these giant loopholes that's contained in this document, in this bill, which is some 87 pages long, Mr. Speaker. So the bill, maybe in this sense, in some ways, should be called perhaps the surplus profit tax, maybe, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. And the companies, by the way, according to this bill, would not actually have to pay the taxes unless if they've recouped all of their co uh, capital costs, Mr. Speaker. So we're very, very, very long ways from actually seeing the revenue come in to do this so-called tax-free BC, to reach this tax-free tax BC, or debt-free BC, I should say, agenda that the Premier had promised, Mr. Speaker. And I should say that this prosperity fund, I don't know about you, Mr. Speaker, but I fear that we may never see this prosperity fund, most certainly not in the next few years, I would project, Mr. Speaker. There's no indication of how that would come about, actually, based on the government's own projections now, the reduced projections, that Actually, in actual fact, maybe the Premier should have been saying right from the start so that British Columbians would actually know what they can expect from government in terms of the LNG industry as opposed to these grandiose promises that the Premier had made during the election campaign. And, and, Mr. Speaker, the member from Oak Bay Gordon Head is absolutely right, which is something that we've always known, and this bill, by the way, clearly outlines as well, that there are no revenue projections. There are no revenue projections whatsoever from Bill 6, and hence, Back to my former prediction, that is to say, the Premier's promise on the prosperity fund, whether or not really in reality it would actually materialize. At this rate, I would project, Mr. Speaker, we won't see it come into fruition, I don't think, most certainly not in the next few years, I'm not even sure at this rate what would actually become reality at all. Even the government themselves at this point are not making these projections in terms of actual revenues in that sense. Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, the troubling thing about all of these bills, of course, is that Bill 2, the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act, Bill 6, the Liquefied Natural Gas Income Tax Act, everything that the government had said prior to the election, and now that we're back in the legislature, none of what they said is actually becoming reality. Not by the government's own admission, by way of legislation that they brought forward. Now, the, the government may say, oh, the opposition is just being naysayers. The opposition is not being naysayers. What we're doing is calling the government out on what they said they would deliver versus reality on what is happening, Mr. Speaker. Now, the government obviously do not like that. They don't appreciate that. And so they try to make up attacks on the opposition or any, on anybody who might otherwise 
tout their line. If anybody who will stand up and just correct the government on the record in any way, shape, or form, somehow then they are deemed to be against the industry. But for us, as I said, Mr. Speaker, what we've wanted, and we've always said we wanted, is that we wanted to see guaranteed jobs and training for British Columbians, first and foremost. We wanted to see the resources to benefit British Columbians. We wanted to see a fair return of those resources back to British Columbians. We wanted to see those benefits go to the First Nations community, the very first people of this land, Mr. Speaker. And we wanted to make sure that we protect our air, our land, and our water, and including living up to the climate commitments. These are important goals for all of us, not just for today, but for generations to come. I heard the ministers and members say about the LNG industry, and that is generational change, that it was going to bring generational changes to British Columbians. And I believe that the LNG industry can and will bring generational changes. That's why it is so critically important that we do it right. That's why it is so critically important that we actually get the experts' opinions and thoughts and put those forward. That's why it is so critically important that we tell British Columbians the truth of what's going on. That's why we don't make grand projections and create an environment where there is tremendous amount of distrust in the eyes of British Columbians about this industry. I think we have a responsibility to do that, Mr. Speaker. We have a responsibility and we owe it to future generations to ensure, to ensure that we do this right. And for the opposition, it means those four conditions, four principles that I had advanced and put forward. And I thank you for your time, Mr. Speaker.